everyone. This is Chris Grasso with the Indie Spirituals Podcast hosted on the Be Here Now Network. And I'm humbled and honored to have my uh, dear guest today, Michael Imperioli, with us. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. Appreciate it. So really quickly, uh, just a bridged uh, version of Michael's bio. Michael Imperioli is best known for his Emmy winning uh, performance as Christopher Moltisanti on The Sopranos. He also wrote five episodes of the show and was co-screenwriter of the film Summer of Sam, directed by the incredible Spike Lee. Imperioli has appeared in six of Lee's films and has also acted in films by Martin Scorsese, Abel Ferrara, Walter Hill, Peter Jackson, and the Hughes Brothers. Michael has been involved in the New York rock and roll scene since the mid-80s when he played guitar in the post-punk no wave band Black Angus with filmmaker Tom Gilroy. Currently, Michael is a guitarist and lead singer for the band Zopa, whose uh, album La Dolce Vida was released this summer on Bandcamp. It's a rocker. I've been really enjoying that, Michael. And, thank you. Uh, we'll definitely get into that as well. So again, thanks for taking the time to do this. My pleasure. So there's a million ways we can uh, start this conversation, but I figured... Um, the reason I reached out on a, you know, just on a long shot was I was turned on to your Instagram page by a friend. I would, you know, of course, Soprano is my favorite show of all time. I'm one of those guys. Um, but when I saw your Instagram page, you know, I see Dharma and then I see rock and I saw my bloody Valentine of all things, though I am an, in, uh, is an anything guy. I know you posted loveless, great record, but and it isn't anything does it for me. But anyways, it's a great record. Yeah. So I saw all that and I'm like, well, let me reach out. You have this rad band Zopa. Um, let's just, you know, and and I got the email back. So I figured where we'd start is with Dharma. Um, what I loved is that not only are you posting pictures of teachers, but I mean you're real deal teachers like Dilgo uh can't say Rinpoche, who his book Hundred Verses uh of advice has been huge for me in my life, Trungpa Rinpoche his whole body of work cutting through spiritual materialism is huge for me. Um, you know, so you're posting real like Tibetan Buddhism and, uh, and I was really super impressed by that. And then you're doing these meditation one-on-one classes, which are phenomenal. So let's start there spiritually. What was it that drew you to the Dharma? Um, was it Buddhism in the beginning? What, what brought you to that path? I got turned on to the Dharma when I was 19 through Jack Kerouac. Very cool. to, you know, I was a big fan of his work and the beats, but especially Kerouac. And I bought the Diamond Sutra at St. Mark's Bookshop when I was 19 years old, and I could not penetrate it at all. But there was something about whatever the flavor of Buddhism was to me at the time that uh, I felt made sense. But I was not prepared to explore a Dharma path. I was much more interested in pursuing uh, you know, acting and music and theater and all that stuff. And I was, you know, I was uh, all in, in terms of, in terms of that. And then as I got older and after I had kids and had some success and made some money and, and had some acclaim and things like that, um, there was a lot about, I took, you know, there was a lot of things about myself that I didn't like on a personal level. And I, you know, I realized that there was a spiritual component to my life that was missing that I kind of thought I had, but I didn't really. It was very lip service. It was very surface. It was very unformed, really. And I started looking to a lot of spiritual disciplines, very diverse um, selection, everything from Gurdjieff and Uspensky and uh, Blavatsky, Krishnamurti, occultism, Castaneda, uh, Christian Science, Ernest Holmes, um, uh, shamanism. There's a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And some of it was more, I think, interesting than others, but and more of a heartfelt path than others. Occultism kind of, I got scared off occultism very quickly <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> by some, some very weird thing that happened. But um, uh, what I noticed is I'd be really say I'd read even someone like Krishnamurti who had a lot of, you know, amazing teachings. I'd be into the teaching and then the book was over and then I, I was back to my old self. There was no practice. There was no integration into, into my daily life. And, and, and there was no, there wasn't really a lot of change. Like I could agree with everything in the book and it would all make sense. But then when the book was over, I had, you know, there was no foundational thing to rely on in my life. And then, uh, one day we saw a uh, 
an ad for a, a, I think it was in like East West was like a spiritual bookstore in New York. And there was like a, a thing about a Dharma center. It turned out there was a Dharma center about five, five, six blocks from where we were living in New York at the time, my wife and I. So we went. It also turned out that maybe um, 20 years before it was a notorious after hours club with drug, sex and rock and roll. Like really. And both my wife and I used to go there before we knew each other. Right. And now it was a Dharma center. And it was a Tibetan Lama by the name of Gelek Rinpoche. Uh, Ju- a place is called Julhart. It's still there. Gelek Rinpoche passed away a few years ago, but Demo Rinpoche has taken over. And we started going to classes there. And he was, um, he had once been a monk. He had once been roommates with uh, Trumper Rinpoche in India when they were both still monks. And then he eventually disrobed, but was teaching in the Gelek, you know, tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. And that was the beginning. And we kind of, we actually wound up opening a Dharma center for another Lama, a Tibetan Lama who uh, was in the U.S. for a while and then wasn't in the U.S. And, and eventually we made our way to Garchen Rinpoche of the Drikken Kagyu tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. And we took refuge with him and he's been our, our, our root teacher ever since. That's amazing. I, um, I had the great honor of studying with uh, Kenshir Rinpoche in Connecticut at Chen Rizig, um, Tibetan Buddhist Center. And he was actually the head teacher in Dharmasala of His Holiness's monastery. And then he went mm. to Ithaca when His Holiness opened a monastery there. And then he retired, moved to Middletown, Connecticut, which was like 15 minutes where I was living of all places. And this is going back like 15 years ago. Wow. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, we dove in. He was, you know, he did uh, the great treaties on the stages to the Path of Enlightenment. He's teaching out of that. Wow received the medicine Buddha transmission from him, which he received directly wow. from his holiness. It was a, uh, it was a wonderful experience, but I'll be honest. It, I wasn't quite ready for that. I mean, Tibetan Buddhism is heavy stuff in a very beautiful way, but. Yeah, I, it can be. I mean, it's, it, it, it can be, and it can also be, you know, there, there's something for everyone. I think um, it, it, it appealed to us right away. And you know, a lot of people always say, have you ever read this? Have you ever looked into this book? I, and it's like, um, once in a while, I'll pick up a little bit of Zen or Thich, I love Thich Nhat Hanh sure, and yeah. um, Suzuki Roshi. You know, but mostly, I, you know, there's so much in my tradition, specifically what I learned from Garchen Rinpoche and so much to practice. I pretty much stick there just because, you know, I, there's only so much time in this lifetime to uh, <laughs> to practice. So, this is true. you know, this works. It's where I'm at, and and um, you know I, I I'm kind of all in yeah. there. You know what I mean? And it, it it's you know having that practice made all the difference. You know, really committing to a practice and committing to a tradition, and then finding a way to input. You know, and I, I when I started, I wasn't aware of <laughs> what it would actually take. I remember <laughs> I kind of thought, well, I'll take refuge. I'll become a Buddhist once in a while. I'll go to teachings and then, you know, I'll be a changed person. And right. I realized quickly that that's not how it worked. Even the first teacher I had who said, you know, gave me a certain practice and said, you know, you do this 20 minutes a day in the morning. I'm like 20 minutes every day. Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll never be able to do this. Right. This is no, I can't, you know, and it's like, that was where I started, you know, but, um, as you go, you know, or as we went, my wife and I, these teachings became more and more important in our life. Um, you know, and facing a lot of my own faults and delusions and, you know, flaws and, you know, of which I have had and have many and are still dealing with. And, uh, you know, but um, it's an authentic path. And if it interests you and you have that, you know, and you have the, you know, the, the connection to it, you know, whatever works, right? That's what I always say. I like the comment about 20 minutes. I remember similarly 10 minutes for me. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. You know, I'm coming from this crazy punk rock, hardcore hip hop, like yeah. angsty. And then it's like, you want me to sit quietly? Like, get the fuck out of here. But, you know, yeah. I did and I stuck with it. And it's, you know, I think of Trungpa Rinpoche's quote where he says, like, it's better not to start at all, but if you're going to start, you have to go all the way, you know, I'm paraphrasing there, but, and I'm glad that I did. Like, I'm just like you all in while I'm not Buddhist per se. I draw from, first of all, the, all the great wisdom traditions, like you mentioned, I have a deep reverence for them. I found something beautiful in them, but for me, it's Eastern philosophy, 
Nagarjuna's yeah. two truths, which I think go very beautifully with Hinduism in the lineage of Ram yeah. Das and Maharaji. And, um, you know, I just, that's my practice. And I think it's beautiful. And I love that you, you know, kind of jumping into your Instagram meditations, you know, I, I've watched them and, and w- wonderful meditation 101. It's literally like you're presenting it in such an accessible way for people, which I really appreciate because, you know, you're, people love you. They adore you for your work, which, you know, rightfully so. And you're taking that and using it for like, for benefiting other people, the Dharma right there. Like, so what inspired you to get started on that um, meditation 101 on your Instagram page? Well, um, Instagram, I, I got on Instagram at the end of last year. And I really didn't know what I was doing. Well, I got on because I was on a TV show on NBC and they were encouraging the actors to have account. It helps promote the show. And I right. was like, okay, because I also do a lot of independent stuff, live readings and my music stuff and my book stuff. And I was like, this is a good way to get the word out for the indie stuff that a lot of people don't get into. But quickly, I, you know, I realized, you know what? I think what I want to use Instagram for is turning people on to stuff that inspires me. Other artists, Buddhism, politics in some ways. So I, it became that right away. And, and one, once I started posting about Buddhism, people, people started de- direct messaging me and asking for meditation instructions, literally. So, and I would type them back. Right. Very simple, pithy meditation instructions. And that started happening a lot. So I was like, Well, I put it out there. I posted one day, would anybody be interested in like a video, me making a meditation video and putting it on IG Live. And it was a lot of response, positive response. And it was like, well, maybe we'll do it live. And I tried to do an IG Live and it was just a disaster. My connection was bad. But what happened was Nick Solidio, who is my producer in Chicago, DM me and said, hey, I do this webinar stuff for Second City in Chicago. I can help you. So he said, we, you should do it on Zoom. You advertise it on Instagram. They go to the link, they register. We do this free webinar. And he made it turnkey for me, which yeah. was good because I'm not techie. And um, I asked my teacher first before I did it. I told him what was going on. I told him the background for it. And he said, you don't need to ask me, ask your own mind. If you have a mind that wants to benefit others, that's what you have to realize. And he said, Buddha is not the name of a man. It's the name of mind, really. And that's what you're dealing with. And it was very beautiful. So we started teaching the 101. We did seven 101 classes. And I, I made it pretty secular. I didn't really do a lot of Buddhist flavor. Right. But in the discussion and Q&A, there was a lot of interest in the Dharma. So we do these polls on the thing. So we polled anybody want to learn about Buddhism and it was 97% of the students. So I asked my teacher again, I said, they want the Dharma. And he said, well, basically, yes, you know, make it about the mind, make it about loving kindness. Um, but there, and, but make it more of a discussion about things. And a lot of people are interested in karma. Right. There's a lot of discussions of karma after Trump got the COVID virus because people said it's karma. And it's like, you know, trying to explain that karma is not just this, you know, you know, cosmic judgment, you know, thing, but it's about causes and conditions. And and it is about cause and effect, but it's a lot more, you know, interdependent and complicated than just like, you know, we're punishing you because you did this. I mean, there's an element of that, but it's not it's not so literally that. And um, so now, yes, uh, Monday was. Meditation 102, the first session. And um, I started off a bit with just the life of Buddha. Who was Buddha? And what happened to Buddha? And got into the first of the two Four Noble Truths a little bit. Um, I have to do a lot of study before class because I'm a student. I'm not a teacher. You know, I'm just sharing. I'm kind of parroting what I've been taught and what I read. And, 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 and but, um, this is a long winded answer, but basically when people ask for these things, I feel obliged to give it to them. I love, if I can, if you can, I love that you say that you're a student and you're parroting. So to, so to speak, or, or paraphrasing, um, in a way when I've watched your work, uh, it resonates very deeply with me. I have three books published as well. And, uh, 
I cringe when people like I speak at conferences and that's part of what I do speaking and, and writing. I'm and, getting the books uh, by the way. I, yeah, uh, I sent I them. They're on my on the way, I heard. So that's yeah, good. I look yeah. forward to that. Thank um, you. I hope you dig them. They're um what the approach I take is I try like you to make it accessible. Especially I, I, I every week I teach um in a youth uh, mental health and healing residential program for teens with all different mental health issues and uh is that Connecticut? Or are you still yeah, in Connecticut? Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. It's down in Bethlehem. It's a really wonderful. Um, they have a few of them throughout the country, but I've been there for five years. And every week I go in, there's a boys campus and a girls campus. And there, when I write, they're kind of who I have in mind because these teachings from, you know, Nagarjuna and Trunkpa and, and all these wonderful teachers, if I were to go in there and give this book, you know, that chances are they're just going to put it right down. Like, no, thank you. Yeah, like I did. Right, and as did I. Yeah, so I'm right. trying to distill it in a way that very much like it, that's what resonated with your approach is I'm here to benefit the people and you're you know presenting it in a way where I've watched your videos and I did appreciate that they were a bit more secular in nature while still the, the hint of Buddhism was there. And it's cool that you're doing 102 now. Um, so all that to say, you were saying you you study, do a lot of study. Do you mind if I ask like what books you're you're working out of before you do these um there's a couple i mean there's uh some of trumpa rinpoche stuff sure. there was cutting through spiritual material and there's a book called the path is the goal the dalai lama you know is a good always a good way to, of course uh, for basic beginning buddhism a lot of his stuff uh i'm re i'm reading a really good book called karma what it is and what it isn't by uh i, th I believe it's called, pronounced trala Kyabgan Rinpoche, fantastic, brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, you know, and a lot of, uh, sometimes I just get teachings on the various Instagram sites sure. that I, you know, the pithy stuff, Zonzo Kense Rinpoche, uh, what, what makes you not a Buddhist? I, I like uh, his stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much sticking to the Tibetan, you know, tradition. Um, and, you know, so I think it's, you know, people just seemed interested. So I, I, we're going to, it's, it's all really an experiment, yeah. you know, to see, you know, where it goes. Um, I think it's, you know, the irony is not lost on me that people who knew me because I played a junkie killer <laughs> psychopath are now sitting in meditation. I get that, how weird that is, but this has been a difficult time for a lot of people. Yes. And I think a lot of people are looking for, ways to cope yeah you know? yeah absolutely and but that's the beauty of it is i think it is a trip you know like i've gone through the whole series of sopranos at least 10 times like i'm not kidding this is my favorite show and and it was a trip for me to see at first it was hard it's like holy shit christopher's teaching meditation you know and i had to like and my fiance <laughs> actually had never seen the show until you know last year i brought her through the whole thing and now she calls Chrissy, she calls me that because of the Sopranos. Um, thank you. But um, she saw it and I was watching the the video on Instagram and she came out and she's like, what, what's that? And I'm like, it's Michael Imperial. He's teaching, you know, meditation. She's like, and sh same deal. It, it, it's a trip. But once you get past that, like how cool, man, like, I don't know. It's, I think it's wonderful. I think, you know, what a service that you're doing. Anytime I see somebody using you know, whatever, um, I don't know, uh, clout they have to benefit others. I think that's absolutely wonderful what you're doing. And so, I mean, we could spend all day on this. There's other stuff. I know your time is limited and I appreciate that. I just, um, one thing I did want to ask you to go back if you don't mind. And if you do, that's fine. But you said something about a weird occultism experience and then you kind of jumped aside is, do you mind sharing about that? Just out of curiosity? Um, not long after my wife and I moved in together, we all had a lot of books in the house and she had some books from her prior marriage when she lived in Germany or something. There was a, a book, a real literal, you know, grimoire, a culture, sure, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, the real deal. And I don't know, she doesn't, she didn't even know how it was in the library or anything like that. And um, I started reading it. And she said, you know what? You probably shouldn't read. Let's get rid of that. Don't read that book. And I'm like, no, no, it's cool. I'm kind of interested and, in, you know, I, whatever it is I use for good, you know. And, um, you know, and I got 
kind of started slowly getting sucked into this book. It definitely had a hold on me. So one night she was at work. I was alone in the house. My brother was staying with us and he was in the next room. And I'm reading this book, getting really deep into it. And this big fire starts in the room that I'm in. The, the drapes somehow went up in flames because of a light, I don't know, a light bulb or something like that. I've never had a fire in any place where I live, knock wood, Whoa. ever. Yeah. And this was out of control very quickly. And I start screaming for my brother and he comes running in. And we're getting, you know, blankets or water or whatever. But it, it was really, really scary. It wasn't a little thing. It was quite significant. And it was kind of like... Um, I got to like a bridge or a precipice or a door and that was the door. And it said, if you go past here, you go past here yeah. and just know it's real and it's whatever yeah. and be prepared. And I was, and I didn't want to go through that door and that was the end of it for me. Well, fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. I just, I find those stories fascinating. And I, I have had grimoire. I've read Necronomicon and you know, all the, the deep stuff as well. And, um, I can't say I've had any experiences, but you know, I, I find the uh, iconography of of occultism very fascinating. But beyond that, um, so I, do I. Yeah, so do I. I think um, you know. Listen, there are definitely our minds are, are are a lot more than just our thoughts and our brains and stuff. I I, I think consciousness at its ba- ultimate you know level is attuned with a lot bigger things than just our own sense perception and bodies and things like that. Sure. And it's in, and, and there's an interconnectedness on a very profound level. So, and that can, you know, that can be tapped into in many different ways. Yeah. No doubt about it. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, so let's see. That's a true story. <laughs> oh, I trust me. I believe you. I've, I've heard a few. That's why I asked. <laughs> so whoever was at that door, friend or foe, they did me a favor. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it worked out for you. <laughs> so um, something I wanted to ask you about, I know you're super passionate about theater. And I just saw earlier today that Broadway's got pushed back again. And uh, unfortunately, due to COVID. But, you know, something I don't know how often you get to talk about this, um, but your wife, Victoria, and you founded and are artistic directors of the Off-Broadway Theater Studio Dante. Uh, I don't know if that's still there or not, but I would love to. It's not. I, it's not. Do you still it's want not. to it talk lasted, a bit about uh, Sure. Um, we built, my wife and her father-in-law literally built it from scratch. It was an old nightclub, actually, I think. And we built this theater that looked like it was from the 19th century with gilded moldings and upholstered wall. I mean, it was quite beautiful, like a little jewel box, 75 seat. And we dedicated it to discovering and producing new plays, new works mm. of theater. Uh, they had to be stuff that had not been done before. And we had it for, you know, about seven years. We did a lot of world premieres of great shows and a lot of great actors and directors and writers who have gone on to careers in television and film and things like that, participated. Sure. Um, we got kind of slammed after the economy tanked in like 2009 and we lost a lot of our funding. It was not-for-profit theater. So that was our kind of the death uh, of the theater. Um, but, um, there were a lot of good seeds planted and it was a great, uh, great experience. Um, I think we're in the process of moving back to New York from California. So we'll probably get involved in theater again. I'd rather not do it so much as a producer, but maybe as a director and my wife is set designer. Cause that's, she did the sets for all the plays there. Um, but, um, it was, uh, we were artistic directors and it wasn't really a company, but it kind of became one by default because there was several colleagues that we had worked with before over the years that wound up being, you know, kind of our go-to people for certain things. And then a lot of neat people we didn't know who came aboard and participated uh, while we were there, but it was, it was a great experience and, and, and very, very intimate. It was very small, very intimate and um, a, a beautiful theater and a beautiful ex- theater going experience for the people who, who got to go. I think that's super cool. I hope by the time you get back to New York, things will be a little bit more open. That's it's going to be so hard for the theaters. Very hard. 
Yeah. I mean that yeah. and um, music clubs, you know, I have a friend who books pretty much all the concerts in Connecticut and they've resorted. He's very resilient. They're doing actual shows at a farm and they're doing they, they did a uh, dinosaur junior yeah my friend mark did that show yeah yeah that's cool yeah. i'll let him know you heard that's about one that. of my oh. favorites oh yeah they're incredible lou barlow yeah. jay they're they're amazing i met jay yeah. at a um ama thing once it was a trip to see him he's a da- he did an album for ama yeah yeah, so yeah. He's a and i know him and, uh, yeah, him and krishna das performed together a lot up in northampton and or did at least but yeah it's a very hard time theaters clubs all this stuff um but Do you know Miracle Legion at all? No. They're a Connecticut band. Um, kind of from the same period of Dinosaur Jr. Like around, they kind of came out of the same movement or something. They're friends of mine for many years. But you should check oh, them cool. out. They've been I will. around a long I, time. Yeah. I did Connecticut. I'm surprised I haven't heard of them then. Um, but yeah, so look, talking about music, you are the singer and guitar player for this super rad band called Zopa. Um, am I pronouncing that correct? Zopa? Zopa is the... The, my middle name, Dharma name. So my, okay. my Dharma name is Konchuk Zopa Sonam. And Zopa means patience in Tibetan. Very cool. Um, yeah. So uh, you wouldn't, I wouldn't Zopa, necessarily associate that with the music when I hear it. It's very, it's, you guys are a rad, like rock. Like, it's great. I'm glad you like it. Yeah. Um, I do. I, uh, I like I love playing with the Olmo Tai and Elijah Amaton. Um it's a trio and um it's very much a band. It's not like a solo project with sidemen right. or anything like that. It is a band. We write stuff together. Um you know, uh we formed it's kind of a weird history. Um when I was 25 I did a movie called Postcards from America about the artist David Wonorovich and I was 25 and there was an 18 year old actor named Michael Ty who played David as a teenager. Michael Ty went on to play guitar in Jeff Buckley's band. Oh, wow. Michael's brother, Omo, who was eight years old, played that lead character as a boy. uh, Fast forward 20 something years. I run into Michael, who I'd seen from, I would see from time to time. I run into him at a party. And I was think this is 2006, 2005, the end. I was, I, I was thinking about forming a band. Because I hadn't been in a band in a long time. Although I was playing music by myself, but I missed being in a band. But I run into Michael. I said, how's your brother, Omo? Who I hadn't seen since he was eight years old. He said, Omo plays the drums and he works at the Strand Bookstore. And for some reason, I got it in my head that Omo and I should play music together. And I don't know, I don't, he didn't tell me what kind of music he played or what kind of drummer he was. And I knew other drummers on the rock scene in New York that I could have asked. Sure. Some weird thing in my head said, no, I got to. So I start going to the Strand bookstore. All the employees wear big name tags. So I'm like, well, this will be easy. I'll go there and pretend I'm browsing and I'll see his name tag and I'll approach him. I don't see him. I start going like twice a week <laughs> looking for this guy <laughs> for a couple of weeks and I don't find him. So finally I ask an employee, I said, does a guy named Omo work? He goes, oh yeah, he works in the warehouse. So I write a note and I said, can you give this to him? And he calls me. He goes, yeah, let's, um, let's play. He goes, I know a bass player I went to high school with. I said, that's great. So the day before we were supposed to meet at the studio this i'm at the flea market and this guy walks up to me he says oh i'm playing music with you tomorrow (laughs) my wife and i are at a booth at the flea market and my wife knows the guy who's running the booth so elijah was this guy's son (laughs) and he was at you know he introduced it turns out his cousin used to manage me as an actor when i was starting out it was all these very weird and then the next day we met in a rehearsal studio and we just started jamming and we never stopped. And uh, well, we did stop for a few years. We took a hiatus the last few years, but um, and Omo wound up marrying my first cousin and they have two kids now. Wow, that is an insane chain of events. So yeah. what's the writing process like, especially now? I mean, I'm in two bands currently myself and with COVID, it's a lot of recording, sending things, writing parts in our head and, you know, doing things like that. What's you're in California or those guys are in New York. I'm 
assuming. So what's the, the... They are. We've been on hiatus for a while. We recorded this album several years ago and it was kind of sitting on the shelf and then the Instagram thing kind of happened this year and we were like, let's just start getting the word out. Let's put this, let's just make this available. I'll start posting about it. I, I started doing all these interviews uh, in music magazines and websites after my, my bloody Valentine post went kind of semi-viral. <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm doing all this press and, you know, in, Instagram's kind of happening. So we put it on Bandcamp and got really good response. Um, but now that I'm moving back to New York, it's kind of really good timing. We're now having a meeting on Monday with someone who can like, uh, we want to get to help distribute it on other platforms, press some vinyl and all this stuff. So when I'm back in New York, we could start working together again. But, um, you know, the, we we haven't been writing actively lately, but the writing process would be, I mean, sometimes I'd come in with an idea, a chord progression, may, sometimes a whole sometimes a whole song, sometimes Omo would start a drum beat. And, we, you know, there's one of our songs called Stanley. It's not on the album, but I'd started with a drum beat and he sings some of it. And then I, you know, um, sometimes it's a bass line and I'll start playing a chord progression over it. And, you know, it's... Um, it that's the beauty and the mystery of creation you know it, who knows where these things come from you know yeah absolutely well, it's very but it's cool. very collaborative you know yeah well if, if for listeners or people watching the video whether you're on the be here now network or indie spiritual site the band camp for your page is going to be linked so just scroll down whether it's Thank the you. audio version or the video and we'll have it linked. Cause uh, I'm not kidding. I, if I didn't dig it, I wouldn't have brought it up, but I really, really dig it. It's very cool. Very like, like I said, like kind of punky, but Rocky. And um, I don't know, again, it's, it's not, it doesn't, you know what? No, I do hear the Dharma in it. And that's the beauty of everything. Like the Dharma is there. If you're willing to see it, I, I truly believe that. Um, and, and I hear it shine through for sure. Well, there's some direct, lyrical references to dharma uh and um uh so it, yeah there is some there um it's been this year's been really it's been really great having the record getting feedback on the record it was you know when we started out first of all we were a lot more raw and unrefined than what you hear on the record when we started sure. you know yeah. um I had never sang, really sang much in public. You know, I, I sang with one band very, very briefly, but we never did any shows. And um, I was still trying to figure out what my sound on guitar would be. And, you know, I, I started with a lot of distortion to kind of hide my um, shortcomings <laughs> and things like that. But um, I understand. But slowly over time, you know, it developed. And, you know, there was something that I, I had in mind that I was going for and we got to at some point, but it took a while. And in the beginning, we started the band the year before The Sopranos ended. So by the time we started really getting going, The Sopranos had just ended. So there was a whole weird, I think, still kind of preconceived preconception and expectations and things of who I was and what I was doing. Sure. And um it just i think got in the way a little bit of people yeah. kind of just relating to it as for music but you know instagram has kind of um i always thought people knew all the stuff that i did i i thought everybody <laughs> knew i was into buddhism or knew that i played music or knew that i did this or that or and it wasn't the truth at all most people didn't most people thought i was that like pretty much like what you see on the sopranos so between the podcast and instagram uh people got to learn different sides and aspects. And I think it, it's allowed them to kind of look at the music on its own terms rather than through the filter of the Sopranos. For, yeah. Per se. No, I think that's so cool. Cause I knew of course, uh, Stephen Van Zant with Bruce Springsteen and even uncle junior who put his album out that episode where he sings at the end, it was, I mean, brought me to tears. Yeah. Like, so I, yeah. but I, you know, I had no idea that you were a musician as well. And then I find that out and not only a musician, but in like, the genre that I really dig. Um, super cool. So yeah, very, very cool. Now as a music nerd, I've got to ask you rig rundown. Like, is there any go-to that you have to have like guitar and pedals, like anything? Like, It's what all you... go-to. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very specific. I use it, uh, the album and all the shows. I use the same guitar. It's a 66 Jaguar 
which same year as me. And it was modified by Rick Kelly of Carmine Street Guitars, who there's a documentary about him out called Carmine Street Guitars. He He's a fascinating guy on his own who's been building these guitars out of centuries old wood from demolished landmark New York City buildings. Yeah. He turned me on to a whole theory about music and instruments and stuff, which maybe we'll get into later. But <laughs> he modified it with, took out the single cause and put humbuckers. And um, also, uh, the ja the 66 Jaguar has lots of switches for different pickups and combinations of pickups. And I, right. I wanted it to be just tone and volume. So he bypassed all that stuff. Um, just to kind of dumb it down for me, <laughs> for my, <laughs> for my uh, level of, you know, expertise. Um, but... Uh, it has a very distinct sound because it's a distinctive, you know, the way it was, what it is originally, and then how it was modified has a lot of sustain and it has a really good tone on its own. And then I basically use a handful of pedals. I use a MXR Distortion Plus. I use a Rat. I use a uh, small clone. I use a MXR Phaser. I use a, a Boss Digital Delay and a big muff um and that's pretty much it oh wonderful um, that's to... enough right now there's a lot to explore just with that stuff oh and i i i, I just i i have one uh, pedal that i i want to start using i've had it for a long time but i never put it in my rig and it's a it's a mxr blue box that was once owned by robert quine I don't know if you know about Robert Quine. You know, and I know I definitely know that name. Why do I know that? Robert name? Quine was in uh, Richard Held the Voidoids. Well, he was in, okay. and um, he played in Lou Reed's band during the Blue Mask period. Oh, yeah. okay. And uh, he's he played with Lydia Lunch, and he's a he kind of was called the virtuoso of punk. He passed away, but Rick uh, Rick Kelly at Carmine Street was good friends with him and has had some of his equipment. So. I want to use that a bit, but those pedals, you know, and, and trying to figure out how they work together and what kind of sounds you can make. But the, um, the guitar and the amp, usually I like a, um, I have a Kendrick, which is a great old tube amp that I use sometimes, but, um, Marshall, uh, I like the JCM 800. Is, oh yeah. I love, and I love, I like certain Vox, uh, amps and, um, matchless. I've liked that one. Um, uh i we we did one show it was interesting we did a show at the gibson showroom and you know they invited us and they said come you have you know you got to play a gibson you know because it's a gibson showroom so come and pick out a guitar for the show to use for the show so i picked out a sg and you know, every guitar is, they're like people. They're just different, you know, yeah. no matter, even if it's the same guitar, they're different, you know, wood is different, trees are different. Everything's right. different, you know, everything counts with sound, right? When you're right. creating sound through instruments. And the SG just had a ver had less sustain than my guitar. And I could get similar uh, sounds with the amp and with the pedals and stuff, but the sustain was like a fraction off. And it affected the whole timing of how I played, you know, especially leads, you know, because I'm used to knowing how that sound rises and falls and how much it sustains mm -hmm. and how much, how quickly it goes away. And it didn't have as much sustain and it just <laughs> messed me up so bad. <laughs> this very subtle difference. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm very, I have very strict constraints as a guitar player, you know, someone mm -hmm. who's, you know, an expert would be able to, adjust very easily i'm sure to stuff like that but you know i have a very you know my my parameters are narrow you know and i i try to do what i can in that but it it was like a completely different experience for me and not a pleasant one well sgs are great guitars i'm not saying that i'm just saying yeah. what you're used to right. and, and the jaguar is a weird guitar it's not it's not the easiest guitar to play it's it's sure. it's it's trick you know it's um there's other guitars that are a lot more user friendly, but if you get used to it, there's something very um, gratifying about it. I don't know. 
Couldn't agree more. I, uh, I've owned, I think most of the pedals you mentioned. I love those. I have a AC 30 Vox um, behind me. 2000. I love that amp. That's I see it. That's yeah. a great amp. It, I, I, I drove I love the AC 30. I drove four hours. It's from the original owner, the original pedal with it, the original vinyl Vox siding. I drove four mm. hours to buy this thing. And it was only, I got it for like $600 mint condition. What year is it? It's 2005. Um, so it's not one of the newer ones. I mean, it's not super old. I have an 81 Fender Twin Reverb back there too, which, I mean, I run those two together and it just sounds like heaven. Um, I like the, 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 the Twin Reverb. That's a good amp too. Yeah, um, yeah. Fan of those. But the, I prefer the amps with the less, le- as less knobs as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you made me think of when you were saying pedals. Cause like I've owned a few pedals where I feel like I'm taking a college course nowadays. Like I'm reading the manual and there's so many knobs. Like I had to sell a bunch of my pedals. I'm like, I don't have time to learn all this. I need, like, I love the rat. You have your three knobs and it's go, you know, like simple, like, and you get great tone. You just got to, you know, spend a little time with it. Um, the, even the boss DD six, which I used to, the delay that, you know, it's, it's got a lot of, knobs and i mean i've been playing for 20 plus years but still it's so much and when you have like six eight pedals on a board and you're running them all together forget about it so i i relate uh on the fender thing i want to say i bought my first fender last year i've been a gibson guy myself les paul because i like humbuckers the single coils never did it for me and my friend's like well try a tally you know he showed me one that has one humbucker one single coil absolutely fell in love with it um I mean, I play that as much as I play my SG now and, or I have my Les Paul. I have an SG too. I don't play that that often, but um, I, it's funny. I was texting with him yesterday. I'm like, Hey man, I got that jazz master on my mind again. And he's like, I know me too. Cause again, you can either they they're making newer ones. So I don't like newer guitars with humbuckers, double humbuckers, or you can get an older one. And like you said, swap it out the single coils for humbuckers. So yeah. um yeah, I got I, the idea from Co- Kurt Cobain because he did that to his Jaguar. He swapped out the single coils for and and I mean I mean I'm not trying to recreate his sound or tone by any sure, sure. that I could of course, but but I just like that you know um, it was something about the texture of what he did that um, you know especially playing in a trio you yeah. need that guitar yeah. that guitar has to be big yeah you know. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All the all well, three the, instruments have to be big, yeah. right? You got the big muff, which that'll that'll help you out. That and the rat that's fun. For yeah, that. that's that's yeah. fun for for, 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 <laughs> yeah. for leads. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, well, so I'd be remiss. I mean, I, I try not to talk too much about Sopranos because I know, like, you get asked at a million. I, I can only imagine. But I would be remiss. I've got to ask you. I, I do have two questions, if you don't mind. And uh, the first one is the role of Christopher. Um, he was my favorite character in the show. I'm a recovering addict myself. And what I appreciated was one, the way the addiction storyline was written was so real. I've seen, you know, addiction stories written in shows and movies, and it's so unbelievable, you know, coming from someone who's lived it and lived through a number of relapses myself. And I don't know whether it was David Chase or whomever was writing that storyline. It couldn't have been more accurate. And you know, especially the relapse aspect. And when you would relapse and the, the glass of wine that came to the, essentially started Chris's demise to the very end, you know, after you guys robbed the Vipers. But um, so that, you know, portraying that, if, if you don't mind telling me, like who worked on that storyline and how was it for you? Like, what did you do to get into that role and, and portray someone so mm. accurately? Well, the, it was written by, you know, a bunch of different writers. I mean, sure. Uh, you know, depending on who had the who had what episode, uh, sure. but it, you know, um, when you're portraying something like addiction and recovery and you know relapse, those things are, you know, they're specific. So they were definitely by whoever was writing was heavily researched. Sure, um, always. Um, I had played addicts in the past. Particularly, I did a mo- I did a movie that's kind of disappeared. It's not available on di- on. DVD even or stream, let alone streaming. It's available on VHS, I think, and maybe YouTube called Sweet Nothing with Mira Servino. Actually, before it was the year uh-huh. before, I think she did. She became kind of famous on with Woody Allen's movie. But um, it was based on a true story. I met the guy who it was based on. It was about a, a, a guy who was 
had like a white collar job, not not a Wall Street, but like an accountant, you know, and became addicted to crack and just lost everything uh, and rose from, you know, the ashes. But uh, so I, I learned a lot then. And I also have dealt with a, a lot of people with serious addiction problems in my life, you know, friends and sure over the years. Um, so, you know, that's really, you know, where it comes from. I mean, Christopher himself was based on somebody I know really bef before his addiction stuff, you know, in the pilot, his addiction stuff wasn't really, I don't even know if it's even mentioned or full. It's, it's, it's I don't know if that was an issue in the addiction, but his personality I based on someone I knew who did have addiction issues ultimately too. But, yeah. but um, you know, it was for an actor that, you know, those stakes and those states of mind are really fun to play. I mean, the fun, fun may seem strange in such tragic situations, but they are, it's meaty and it's interesting. And, and I know you're, I've read you were sober. You never, or under the influence you portrayed it. So I think somebody asked you in an interview I'd read one time. Oh, um, not during like, shooting. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> not while the camera was rolling. No, but some, I think somebody asked um, you that in an interview I'd read, you know, do you get drunk or high before you film? And you were like, something like, uh, what if the lights don't work? And if you're high and you have to wait, it's, you know, it's just a bad scene as an actor. Um, no, it's horrible. It's, I, I you know, no. Yeah. it's it's not it's not at all good it yeah. doesn't help it, you know when you're acting you need really a lot of control yeah and awareness yeah. being in the moment and when you're you know stoned that's you don't have any of that right you know? sure well so my other question last apparel's question was i, I went back and rewatched the episode uh, earlier today where christopher dies and uh i mean i don't want to spoil it but i i think most people know i know there's a new generation that's very much turned on but that episode, um, you know, I cry twice during it every time I watch it when Christopher dies. And at the end, when Tony, the look in his face where he just goes, I get it. You know, he's out in Las Vegas and the, it's like the sun blinks at him and he's like, I get it. And you see in his face, he almost starts to cry. He tears up. And because like, I, I, I get that feeling. So it's, it's a double whammy for me. I cried at the beginning and the end. And so my question about that is, I know it's not shot in order, but do you have any memories? What was that experience like for you filming your final scenes, especially with James Gandolfini? I know you guys were exceptionally close. Um, what do you remember from shooting those final scenes with together? I mean, I'll be honest, like that the scene when Christopher dies was not well, it wasn't the last scene I shot. Sure. So it wasn't my last day of work. So it was, I'll be honest, it was not that profound that day yeah. i mean listen it was a, it's a heavy duty scene but we kind of it was kind of approached you know like any other heavy duty scene I, I didn't really feel that sense of finale and then i remember my last day at work was some very inconsequential scene <laughs> that wasn't a lot of dialogue it was just some kind of connective tissue type of scene and that was my last day I was ready for it to end. I was ready to, to move on to other things. Like if it was continued, of course I'd continue with it, sure. but I was kind of eager to, you know, see what's next yeah. in my life. It didn't hit me till, it didn't hit me till the, the day the last episode aired. I forget when that was. I think it was June of 2007. We were, most of us were together in Hollywood, Florida at the Hard Rock for a, an event. So we had a QA and a on stage and a celebration and it was most of the main cast, like nine of us. And then it was nine o'clock, it was Sunday night on the East Coast and the, it was gonna air. So yeah. the, the audience was gonna watch it live on some big screen and we all went alone into a private room. None of us had seen it. And it was during the last few scenes. Actually, when that song starts playing and, the, and, and you realize, okay, an hour's almost up. Yeah. This is it. And something really hit me and I realized, oh, wow. This experience, it's not even so much that the show is ending as that I'm not going to be around all these people so much anymore. And mm. that's just what hit me. Yeah. These people that I've come to love and 
are like my family. And because we, we did a lot of stuff together in the off season, some, some plays and movies and appearances. And we traveled to different, you know, events around the country, out of the country. So yeah, you we, guys a would lot be of at us the, were very close. I remember you'd be at the casino often here in Connecticut. Um, Foxwoods many times exactly. for soprano events. So we yeah. were, we were together a lot. We, we ran together. We used to hang out after work and hit restaurants and bars in New York. And so I would realize like, Oh, wow. That's when it hit me. And, you know, watching that finale together. And then when it was over I and mean, the shock of what happened, but, uh, with the blackout, but it was more that, that was paled in comparison to the finale finality that, wow, we're not going to be together anymore. And then it, and it was sad. Yeah. Uh, but, but it was time, you know, uh, yeah. listen, you know, we know in our spiritual practices that, you know, this, this, at least this, lifetime and experiences are impermanent right and yeah. you know not uh, so uh it was um but it was a tremendous experience you know i oh, mean sure. uh, it was the role at the time was exactly what i kind of wanted yeah and was looking for yeah you know yeah that's incredible and and you said it was the last you hadn't seen the last episode yet. Did so did you guys know the controversial blackout ending? Did you know that was coming? I think only I did, but I forgot. I had heard David say at the you know, it ends and just everything goes to black like a year before. Yeah. And I kind of forgot it, nor did I really know what he meant. Right. Like, yeah, of course everything goes to black. That's the end of every show. But I didn't realize it goes to black like yeah. before before it really kind of you know, before it, you know, ties everything up and, and, you know, before it ha offers a certain closure, it went to black. Yeah. Well, but, um, I, I loved the, end. I was with everyone else when it appeared, you know, I was watching it as it aired in real time. And I was just like, what just happened? But as time went on and, you know, David Chase has talked about it, I think it was absolutely brilliant the way he ended it. I, I love it personally, but I agree. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you for indulging me. I do appreciate that. Um, I no did. Problem. So, you know, we were talking when we started, I know we only have a few minutes left and I don't want to end on like a negative note, but I think it's very important to talk about, um, you know, you made a post earlier. I, we're on the same wavelength as far as polit politics, you know, and, and I appreciate that because I know a lot of Sopranos actors are known for being conservative and Republican and, um, and you're not, you know, you, you speak out about it. And like you were saying, before we started, you'll put a post up and then take it down a day later. Cause it's a lot of negative yeah. energy to take, but I, and sometimes now it's become a couple of hours. Couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's just better for me, you know, and sure. it's like, sure. that's how I get my point across. Right. I, mean, I you know, I don't, well, I, and I appreciate I that because I know when you, when you post that and I've experienced on a, a minuscule scale, scale compared to you, I, I will lose followers, you know, and I'm not saying anything too gnarly. Like I hate you or yeah. it's just calling things out for what they are. And yeah. So yeah, it, it's, it's disconcerting where we're at right now to say the least uh, after four years of this yeah. insanity. Um, and I hope, hope, hope Biden gets it. I've already voted, mailed it in. Um, so did I. Good. I'm so glad. I mean, um, I had a friend I was talking to not that long ago. Who, she's like, I don't think I'm going to vote this year. And I said, that's, that's entitlement. You know, she, she's a, a, a white friend and, you know, I'm like, I have African-American friends and gay friends who would ask you to vote for them. Like, I'll probably be all right. If it goes with Trump, I'm a white male and, and that's who I am, but it's my friends that I'm, I don't know for. about that. Well, yeah. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Anybody's going to be all right. <laughs> You're right. Good point. But I, I, in the scale of like others that are struggling with things like I'm wondering, no, of course. I'm not going to, you know, get like called no. these names, but yeah. So, um, I don't know. I, I don't know that I had a question. I, I wanted to bring it up. I, I wanted to say, I respect you for putting it out there that, you know, you, you're not shy about your leanings and what, what the country needs to do to continue on as a country. Um, so I guess, yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, well, I was, you know, I guess when I made my first political post, I was kind of shocked because I was kind of under the impression that everyone who liked me thought like me, and that's very ignorant of me. 
first of all, and presumptuous. And it was not the case. Actually, there's a lot of a lot of my fans or fans of the Sopranos, maybe they're no longer my fans, <laughs> uh, think differently politically. Which is, you know what? It's okay. But what what happens seems to happen is you post something and then you get this very vicious response yeah. and insulting response and profane and all this. It's not, you know, some people, I've had some experiences where I've got into very constructive debates with people on the opposite side who were willing to talk and hear me out. And I was willing to, a lot of times people just want to be heard. If people just come out and just say, fuck you, you know, or you're an asshole, or whatever, you know, you know, or whatever. And it's just like, you know, there's no dialogue with somebody right. like that. But sometimes people are really curious as to how I've come to these beliefs. And, and, and sometimes it's been very healing to have these dialogues, but you kind of have to wade through so much crap um, that often it's not so, you know, it, you know, you absorb some of that. So you have to kind of pick and choose that. Um, you know, what I think a lot of Soprano fans kind of think that we're like the characters. Um, and like Jim has kind of become this sainted figure among Soprano fans because, you know, he's gone and he was a really good guy. But Jim, he supported the troops off, but he was a Democrat. He was not a, a Republican. I would imagine, and I can't put words in his mouth and I won't, but my instinct would be that he would not like Trump because he was not a Republican. Yeah. He supported the troops, but so do I. Sure. I have a great deal of respect for people who serve our country. Of course. Great deal of respect. Yeah. You know, um, and so did Jim. And we visited people in Walter Reed Hospital who were, you know, coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan without legs and without arms with their heads stapled together. And, yeah. and we, you know, and, and Jim organized that and we, we, you know, we went with him. And, um, uh, but, you know, I think people have kind of reinvented him as Tony Soprano. And that's not the case. It's not who he was. He was an artist. Yeah. You know, people always think, oh, you Hollywood people. Well, for, I have never lived in Hollywood. I don't know what Hollywood thinks, but as if somehow when you become a famous actor, you have to become a liberal. It's like, we're artists. Most artists are on the left. I don't care what you say, they are. And I, when I started out as an artist, I was very poor and so was everybody I know. And we were all lefties pretty much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not that like, now I'm going to be cool in Hollywood and become a liberal. It's like... I was never a conservative. I was never a Republican, you yeah. know. I guess people think you come from this back Italian-American. But I couldn't wait to get to the village, the yeah. East Village and the West Village and where there were artists and people who thought otherwise. I couldn't wait to leave the place I grew up in because I felt it was very narrow-minded. Yeah. And sometimes worse than narrow-minded, bigoted. Sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I so, do know. and I felt... So I, I I got very surprised by that, and and I was kind of fooled and ignorant. And I said, okay, well, when we do the Talking Sopranos podcast, I never bring up politics because it's not about that. And I want that to be a place where people go just to escape. Yeah. We'll we'll talk about the Sopranos. Uh, it's not a place for my politics. It takes is not a place for Steve's politics. Um, and I'll never bring up my opinions there, nor do I, I want people to go there just to enjoy the show. Yeah. But, you know, and I get a lot of stuff, stick to acting. Don't talk about on my Instagram. And it's like, <laughs> no, you're a human. This being. is my page. This is <laughs> where I want to express myself. Yeah. You know, yeah. Go watch the shows. I'm not talking about politics when I'm acting right. and on some talking Sopranos. That is about the show. Yeah. It's not about my politics. I will talk about my, my life and growing up and my experience in show business and acting and who I like in films and stuff. And people like that, but um, I don't feel that's a place I want to talk about. I'm not, I'm not interested in converting people. I'm interested right. in hearing pe people hear my opinion, but that the podcast is for the fans. Yeah. 
you know, and it's for, for your fan to enjoy the show and get deeper into the show. It's not to, it's not my propaganda right. podcast. And just to know, maybe uh, that's coming. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? I do want to know. I was going to say, it's a wonderful podcast. Steve who plays uh, Bobby Bakla in the show, the beloved, you know, he was such a great character, but yeah, the two of you started this podcast earlier this year. It's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, it's so cool for, you know, new fans, old fans. Um, we'll find a link to make sure we post that as well. And uh, the last thing, Michael, I want to ask is, you know, what are you working on now that you're uh, at liberty to to share? Um, I published a short story uh, that is part of an anthology, a really cool anthology called The Nicotine Chronicles that was published by Akashic Books, who published my novel right. two years ago, The Perfume Burned His Eyes. And The Nicotine Chronicles is a series of the drug chronicles, they've done the cocaine chronicles, the heroin chronicles, I think the marijuana chronicles. This is the fourth one. It's Joyce Carol Oates, Jonathan Ames, Eric Bogosian, um, Jerry Stahl, a lot of great writers contributing short stories. Lee, um, Lee Child is the editor. He does a story. And it's tobacco, cigarettes, nicotine as a theme. My story, I, I'm very proud of it. It's called Yasiri. It's, a, it's kind of about... Um, magic like santeria type magic yeah. set, set in the caribbean um sorcery and uh, you know using tobacco as one of the portals to the supernatural world cool. um so that just came out a couple of weeks ago uh i have a movie coming out called one night in miami directed by the actress regina king which it's is about great, muhammad man. ali and malcolm x oh very um, cool and, um, and that's coming out. And um, and you had a small, you were in Malcolm X, I remember, right? You were the a reporter. I, right? was, yeah. I was in Malcolm X and I knew Muhammad Ali. So I have a connection so to both cool. those yep. things. Um, I'm working on adapting my book into screenplay. Awesome. And I have a couple other writing projects that are in early stages. Um, and then we have the, the record. With Zopa, that's out, and hopefully we'll be doing some shows right. um, when there are shows again. And I hope that's really soon because I miss yeah. it. Yeah, and that's that's it. Yeah, awesome. Well, and I've got to say, you are a hell of a writer. I didn't even know about your book. Um, I ordered it, and it's not here. But in the interim, I was I got to read some sample chapters. You can write like holy shit. You you're not just like a famous person. Like I'm going to write a book because I'm famous. You can write. A, what a story. I mean, the premise sounds Thank amazing you. about Lou Reed and um, so cool. Yeah. I can't wait to get the book. Um, but yeah, you, you can write. I'm very impressed. Wow. Congrats, Thank you, man. Well, I mean, I've, uh, I, that was the first prose that, you know, I've actually finished. But I had experience writing screenplays and teleplays yeah. for, for a long time, some of which have been produced and some, most of which have not ever been produced and probably won't and probably shouldn't. But several good things that have been produced you awesome. know, for the screen and for TV. So, Michael, thank you so much for your time. I can't thank you. I mean, there's many other things I want to ask you, but I want to respect your time and people can find you. Instagram is the best place to follow you in real Michael Imperioli. Yeah. On Instagram. It's a great page. We'll yeah. link that up as well. All the links to things we've talked about be on both pages. So anyone listening, watching, just scroll down his band, your Instagram, uh, your book, all sorts of good stuff. We'll have it all linked up. Um, but again, Michael, thank you for, for the gifts you offer this world. Thank you for, you know, taking your, like I said earlier, your, you know, for lack of a better word, the clout, you know, whatever the, you know, the fans you have and, and turning on, them on to Dharma and compassion, something we need now more than ever. So, uh, you know, deep bows of respect and gratitude for you. Uh, for that and just for taking the time and to, to you the same you do, you're doing the same thing with your work and your podcast and your books and your service um and 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 thank you thanks for having me uh, it's a pleasure thank you michael